Welcome everyone and greetings. Thank you so much for joining us for the third live World Food Prize Foundation Digital Dialogue. As you just saw in the webcast, Dr. Rabtan Lal's lifetime achievement and innovation has earned him recognition as the 2020 World Food Prize Laureate. Today, we offer a special opportunity to meet Dr. Lal, if you haven't met him already, to get to know him. Later this year, the week of October 12th, we will fully honor his achievements at the renowned World Food Prize Awards Ceremony, but more to come on that. By the way, you can now read more about Dr. Law's background on our website at Bachelash 2020 Laureate. I'm so pleased to have almost a thousand participants register from around the world for this event, including several of our past World Food Prize Laureates. Thank you for coming today. We welcome your questions. We encourage you to submit them in the form that's on the live stream. We'll share your questions with our laureate and we'll feature answers in future program programming. We won't really have time today. Also, as we proceed, share your thoughts on your favorite social media platform at hashtag foodprize20. We're very fortunate to have two very special speakers today. First, let me introduce our interviewer, Dr. Gabisa Ajeta is chair of the World Food Prize Laureate Selection Committee. He's also the 2009 World Food Prize Laureate. Dr. Ajeta is distinguished professor of agronomy at Purdue University. He's taught there since 1984. He received the 2009 World Food Prize for his work to develop sorghum hybrids that are resistant to drought and the devastating weed stiga. His work dramatically increased the production and availability of food for hundreds of millions of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dr. Ajeta, to introduce our 2020 laureate. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning, Professor Lal. I have to tell you, it was a huge pleasure and honor for members of the selection committee to receive and evaluate your nomination document. So on behalf of the members of the selection committee that gave you unanimous support and the World Food Prize Council of Advisors who endorsed and approved our selection, I extend our warmest congratulations to you, Dr. Lal. And this morning, it's indeed a great pleasure again for me, a great pleasure again for me to sit down on this one-on-one -on -one conversation with you on our digital dialogue live with our laureate. I know that this is not the first prize you received. You've been recognized widely from many organizations refusing, uh, receiving prizes and awards. But I'm also aware that you fully know the history of the World Food Prize and its reputations. And as the story goes, it was founded by Dr. Borlaug, but his first attempt was when he received the Nobel, he tried to persuade the, Lorette, the Nobel subcommittee at, in Norway if they would establish a, a Nobel Prize for agricultural scientists. When that was not successful, he went on raising private funding and established the World Food Prize. When he was successful doing that, the first recipient of the World Food Prize was Dr. M.S. Swaminathan from India, who was the compatriot of Dr. Borlaug in their, in their campaign for Green Revolution in, in Asia. Since then, 49 other high achieving men and women have received the World Food Prize, that's including you. And so over time, as a result of the hard work of the World Food Prize Foundation staff and the reputation of these 50 laureates, the World Food Prize today is recognized as the Nobel of Food and Agriculture, although that's not its official name. So I know that you haven't had much time to dwell on this, but my first question to you is, what does receiving the World Food Prize mean to you and to your work, Dr. Lahr? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jetta. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank Mr. Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Sunny Perdue, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, 
and of course, Ms. Barbara Stinson, the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. I'm grateful to God for the blessings and benevolence, and I'm thankful to those who made this dream come true, including my alma mater, the Ohio State University, and President Drake who nominated me. I want to thank all those who helped me, my wife and family, especially in US, Canada, India, and supporters from around the world. In addition, I must acknowledge the thankfulness on my part for the past and present staff, students, visiting scholars, postdoc of the Carbon Management Sequestration Center of the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environment Sciences. I must thank the World Food Prize Foundation for making me the 50th member of its elite family. During this very auspicious year, which is also the 50th anniversary of Dr. Borlaug receiving the Nobel Prize. Furthermore, it's the 150th anniversary of the Ohio State University. I have a few additional points. One, receiving the World Food Prize reaffirms my very strong belief that the noble task of research and teaching of soil science and agriculture is a world-class profession, second to none. And that has been the basis of my soil-centric approach. Secondly, I must acknowledge though, that the daunting challenge of advancing global food and nutritional security remains to be a work in progress. For example, there are 815 million food insecure people around the world and 2 billion people suffering from malnutrition. Of the 815 million, 40 million are in the US. Almost 200 million are in India. Of the 40 million in the US, 11 million are children. 2 million food insecure people are in Ohio, of which half a million, one in five are children. Even one child going to bed hungry is one too many and not acceptable. Therefore, Dr. Jatav, you and I and others have a work cut out for us. Thirdly, I must indicate that this problem of food insecurity has been unfortunately aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic makes us rethink that we should focus on undertaking initiative that strengthen the local food production system create a resilience in the local food system. We must increase the awareness about the importance of soil health and its impact on producing healthy and nutritious food. And finally, we must focus on making agriculture a solution, not only to food and nutrition security, but also to addressing the environmental issues. Thank you for a very good opening. If I may, I I want to assure, to assure you, in addition to the awesomely humbling feeling it leaves you, the World Food Prize offers great opportunities for personal growth and provides a huge platform and voice for serving a much greater societal cause that may be near and dear to your heart. I know that to be true from my own experience as I have watched it happen to me and as well as to other laureates both before me and those that followed me. If I may, I may add an additional unsolicited advice, the opportunities are going to be many, the demand is going to be high. My friend, I advise you to pace yourself. Moving to, that was wonderful about your story, moving to your story of your work, if we may, we may have some conversation there. I've followed your career since your days at IITA in the 1980s. At the time, you as an Indian were working for a center, CGIR center in Africa. I was working for a CGIR center in India. And uh, I've watched your career expand and rise and how over time your research in soil science have risen in its relevance as well as in, in its uh, impact. In the early years, you followed, you focused on improving soil structure, 
both as a conservation measure, measure and for crop productivity and enhancing soil fertility. Over time, you moved to the emphasis on soil health, soil organic matter buildup, and to organic matter sequestration. And more recently, your advocacy in soils as a carbon sink has been widely heard. Could you share with us how your experiences in the past, recognizing that you've worked in all 40 continents in varied ecologies and varied soils, how these experiences over these environment as well as global events may have guided you, your decision, your research decisions and your research uh, scope and direction. Thank you, Gabiza. Thank you for also bringing up the commonality between our two backgrounds, me coming from India, working in Africa, and you coming from Africa, working in India. Uh, that's an excellent uh, background commonality. I started my work, in fact, at IITA in late 69, early 70, and I was on a steep learning curve. I realized from the very beginning uh, tremendous challenges in maintaining soil physical health, high soil temperature, severe soil erosion problem, low plant available water holding capacity, causing drought and uh, problems even a few days after rain soil prone to crusting, compaction, hard setting, and very, very rapid depletion of soil organic matter that did not help increase the use efficiency of input such as fertilizer because the losses by erosion, volatilization, leaching were tremendous. The challenge was how can the soil health be improved so that the potential of improved varieties such as those developed by you Dr. Swaminath and Dr. Borlaug could really be realize their potential. So I came up with the concept rather than NPK as fertilizer, maintaining soil health, especially soil physical health was a very critical part. The last thing I've learned from that work in Africa that the famine and hunger and the drought were caused more by land misuse and soil mismanagement than by the curse of nature. Therefore, something could be done about it. If I may ask a specific question here, you have dubbed your approach a soil-centric approach over time. Do you remember when exactly you've realized that this approach not only be a leading light for your soil science research, but also could be useful in making a credible case for soil as a carbon sink in mitigating climate change? Oh, thank you again for a very nice question. I must recollect here great contributions from Dr. Borlaug, Dr. Swaminathan, you yourself, Dr. Jetta, Dr. Gurudev Khosh, Dr. Raja Ram, many others who brought in <clears throat> the so-called seed-centric green revolution, which was a miracle era of the 60s and 70s that saved hundreds of millions of people. But there was a problem that Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where I was based, bypassed the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution also stagnating in South Asia and elsewhere and having some severe environmental issue. So it occurred to me while at IITA that there is a need for reconciling the demands of humanity for food and nutrition with the absolute necessity of improving the environment. And that can only be done by having a complementary approach on soil-based issue, which I call soil-centric approach. In my article in 2004 in Science, which almost has 5,700 uh, citations at the moment, more than 22, 2020,000 uh, in the uh, 220,000 downloads of abstract was based on that concept. And the article wrote as president of the Soil Science Society of America on 10 tenets of soil was that. So this idea of seed centric was really complementary to your approach of seed centric coming right from mid 70s. And it's still- Thank you. And you, thank you for that. Your, your citations are extremely impressive. 
in addition to your excellence in research, you have been wonderful in, in your advocacy work, translating the results of your research to political action. And, <clears throat> and in so doing, you've been very strategic in building uh, communication channels, both with the scientific community as well as for in, with policymakers. Reflecting on this experience, what would you say may have been the challenges and opportunities in these efforts for you? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gabiza. Again, a very good point. I believe that unless science is translated into action, it's not complete. And that has been the challenge for me to convince my peers and colleagues in soil science and other basic sciences that we have a work to do which does not end with publication of our research into a peer-reviewed journal. In fact, it is complete only when it's translated into action and adopted by the public. And that translating into action requires strong support from the policymakers. And that's an important part uh, uh, in, uh, that we have to uh, try to convince to the scientific community. At the same time with the policymakers, I have had a big challenge to convincing them and I had the great honor to work with many of them around the world, that the biggest and the most powerful weapon of mass destruction globally is hunger and malnutrition. That kills globally 900, 90 million people, 90 million people. And that is the biggest weapon of mass destruction. And that is what requires focus. It, it translates to 17 deaths every minute. In this 30 minutes dialogue between us, that with 500 deaths. And yet, it's not a newsworthy item. And that needs to be changed through education, through communication. But there are opportunities, many opportunities. COVID-19 offers us opportunity to think about those concepts as well. I think bringing in addition to policymaker, some religious organizations to also help us promote the concept of stewardship of natural resources. From that point of view, even Einstein had felt that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. He also said God is a mystery, but it is really comprehensible mystery. I agree with both of them. I think at this juncture, we need the help of policymakers, general public and the religious leaders. So all community should see the moment to really move forward with those concepts of translating science into action. Tremendous points. And at this point, I want to uh, interject an opportunity. We have two special video messages that we'd like to offer. Uh, as uh, you've already heard, Dr. Lal is our 50th laureate. And we have uh, many alive and still well uh, of, of all of our laureates and, and many have passed, but we have the honor of having our very first laureate still here and with us. Dr. M.S. Swaminathan and his daughter, Madhura Swaminathan, uh, have put together a video that they'd like to share with you. My father, M.S. Swaminathan, was awarded the first World Food Prize in 1987 at a glittering ceremony at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. He used that money to start the Swaminathan Research Foundation with the objective of addressing the problems of sustainable agricultural development of India's most vulnerable farming communities, small farmers, fisher folk, uh, people in tribal areas and other distressed locations. One of his early concerns was to understand the impact of climate change on agriculture and it is wonderful to know that the 50th awardee, Professor Ratan Lal, that his work on soils speaks very closely to current problems of climate change. I'm particularly happy that the 50th World Food Prize is being awarded to Dr. Ratan Lal. Dr. Ratan Lal 
is a transformation agent. He, he, he made soil care and soil protection as a major responsibility. I think it will be a great occasion to honor Dr. Tallar because he is a crusader for soil health, just as Dr. Borlaug was a crusader for plant health and plant protection. I, I wish the ceremony great success, and I particularly uh, congratulate very dear friend and uh, guide, Dr. Atanlal. He, he will always remember. He will always remain a source of inspiration to all of us. Congratulations, Dr. Atanlal, and all the best for your continued service to the world of agriculture. What a wonderful message. Gabisa, back to you. I, I assume that over the years you've worked with both with Dr. Borlaug and Dr. Swaminathan. It seems to me both in your durability as a scientist and in your persistence and relentlessness, your career really copies both Borlaug and, and Swaminathan. And uh, I wanted to, to ask in what ways have these two giants influenced your thinking and approach in science for development over the years? Oh, thank you, Kabija. First of all, let me say how honored and privileged I felt by listening to Dr. Swaminathan, whom I have known since 1963, when I was a student and he was a department head. So it's a great honor to hear from him. Dr. Swaminathan, Dr. Borlaug, you, Dr. Kosh, Dr. Rajar, and many others adopted a philosophy of total human well-being. The idea is that we have a vicious circle of poverty, land misuse, soil mismanagement, environmental degradation, hunger, malnutrition, desperateness, more poverty. Plant breeders like Dr. Borlaug, Dr. Swaminathan, yourself used a seed-centric approach to as an entry point. I used a soil-centric approach as an entry point to break into that vicious cycle for total human development and well-being. And at the same time, restoration and improvement of planetary health and environmental quality. And I think there's a lot of similarity between the two. At this point, I should also mention that I, following their concept, I wrote an article in 2013, Soil and Sanskriti, which means soil and civilization, Soil World Peace Nexus in 2015, and Soil and Sustainable Development Goal in 2018. So the soil-centric approach really has a broad-based concept, overall serving the humanity while also restoring the health of the planet for generations to come. Thank you for those comments. Believing that you may have been influenced by those before you, I would like to ask now what messages you may have for the generation that follows as they take over the mantle and mission of feeding humanity, conserving natural resources and serving the planet. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really greatly uh, privileged and honored to have this opportunity to address uh, the scientific community and the general public and some of the points that I would like to leave as a uh, something based on my personal experience. Number one, to recognize that people are mirror image of the land. When people are poor, poverty stricken, hungry and miserable, they pass on their sufferings to the land and land reciprocates. And this realization that the land and people are closely interacted is very important. And as a result of that, it's important to realize that when people are hungry and desperate, that problem also creates the fanaticism and extremism and whatever else ism that our society is sometimes plagued with. And this hunger, misery, 
can only be quenched by a loaf of bread grown from grains on a healthy soil and that link is very important and the third point i like to mention is that even the sustainable development goals of the united nation goal number 1 and poverty goal number 2 zero hunger goal number 3 water quality and sanitation goal number 13 climate action goal number 15 land degradation neutrality these goals must be put on the track for achieving in 2030 by looking at the soil health restoring soil quality fourth soil is a living thing it is in fact the largest reservoir of the terrestrial biodiversity some people believe 25% of the biodiversity is in soil if soil is a living thing then soil like any other living thing must also have rights rights to be protected rights to be restored rights to be managed judicially simply because you own it does not mean that one can do with it whatever they wish to and that is a very important concept of soil and nature having their rights i am pleased to read sometime the encyclic of pope francis who really very much supports the stewardship of natural resources the fifth point i like to mention is the covid-19 tragedy it really reinforces the need for us to critically consider critically think how we produce store process transport and consume our food and dispose of the waste products in such a way we should adopt this chain of food production system that spare the land the idea to use the best science to produce the agriculture food by the best method we know so that we can maximize the use efficiency minimize the leakage of inputs into the environment air and water and therefore reduce the carbon and environmental footprint of our production systems and save land water natural resources for nature i think 700 million hectare of cereal land if done properly can be returned 200 million back to nature by year 2100 we do not need additional land the last thing i want to mention which i think is very important and that is the soil and agriculture their sustainable use have to be a solution to environmental issue they are not problem if done properly they are indeed the solution and lastly uh gabiza i do want to rephrase my sanskrit upbringing and background the two word which says masudeva kutumbakam the whole world is a family and the covid 19 pandemic teaches us we are indeed a family and if we treat each other well we will certainly be better off in that respect i thinking of contributing my honorarium toward teaching and research in soil and sustainable agriculture i thank you for your very kind opportunity to give to me to talk to the community thank you professor lal for sharing your personal story and the legacy of your work you did it effectively and eloquently your final message to the next generation was particularly spot on your wise words uh, people are images of the land they live on and that hungry miserable and desperate people pass on their sufferings to the land was was a message that resonated with this poor kid from africa to me these wise words along with your advocacy for the rights of all living things including soil is not only a sure way to feeding humanity sustainably but it's also a ticket to saving the planet thank you so very much for giving me this opportunity to work with you thank you gabiza thank you both what a wonderful message for the next generation coming from our inspiring new laureate thank you dr lal dr ajeta for your engaging conversation i know everyone appreciates it and looks forward to hearing more Thank you all for joining us today. Um I have a, a couple of announcements to make. 
we really hope to build on the momentum we've been trying to create through the digital dialogues we've been featuring. And we want to offer a wide array of programming throughout the rest of the year. I have to take this opportunity at this moment to speak on a more serious note. Following so many brutal murders and centuries of unjustified racial violence against the black community, we face a call to action against racial injustice and police brutality in all forms, locally and globally. The World Food Prize Foundation is committed to, to this call and to taking action. We're embarking on a deep examination of our own performance, reevaluating in every direction. We're looking at diversity in our staff, our programs, our partners, our awards process, and all of our audiences they collect together. We're working as a team to develop an internal alignment to reflect external right action in support of the voices of black, indigenous, and people of color. As has already been reflected by both of our speakers, Dr. Norman Vorlog was committed to this. In 1970, at his Nobel Prize ceremony, he said, you cannot build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery. The first essential component of social justice is adequate food for all humankind. We are following his words and continuing his mission. So to build on this commitment, I want to announce that the World Food Prize events in the week of October 12th will take place in a new virtual format. Despite not being able to meet in person, we will take this opportunity to widen our scope and offer more. We hope to offer more interaction through breakout sessions and side events, cross-cutting exploration in a new plenary format that features increased accessibility for a broader audience. We'll try to take advantage of this opportunity. The Borlaug Dialogue will continue to focus on what's most needed to build a resilient food system, one that is equitable, sustainable, and nutritious and will feature much of the work that you've heard about today from Dr. Lal and so many others around the world. And we'll offer a special ceremony, a Laureate Awards ceremony to fully honor Dr. Lal. We're looking forward to offering another set of engaging and dynamic programs this year. You'll find uh, more information about our plans for the week of October 12th coming later this month. So save the dates, the week of October 12th, mostly in the mornings of that week, and if possible and safe to do so, we will also host whatever in-person events we can. So congratulations again, Dr. Lal. Thank you for joining us, all of you, and stay safe in these challenging and important times. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.